people I'd like to recognize. Okay, seeing none, I want to welcome you to the um, Fair Board of Commissioners work session number one. Um, let me just start out by sharing that I sent a letter to all the Metro Council members. It's out in the public domain, letting everybody know what the schedule will be at this point moving forward. Doesn't mean that it's the end all be all of everything that we'll do, but it's just the beginning of us delving through in this process. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're going to have an opportunity for our commissioners to hear presentations about the Bristol business model and the revenue projections, as well as the economic impact on the proposal and the renovation design process. We're gonna spend time with Tom Cross from Metro Legal and with John Cooper from Waller Lansden, going through the development agreement and answering whatever questions we have at this point. Um, beyond that, I am going to go ahead and call on Jerry Caldwell to make a few opening statements. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to um, go straight into that if that works. I can go closer. Is that better? Okay. Yes. Well, thank you guys um, so much for uh, letting us join you. We're happy to be here. Um, as Chairwoman Wiener mentioned, uh, this will be focusing on the presentation on the business model, uh, the first part of it that I'll cover, and then we'll have some individuals that touch on the other, the other pieces. I do apologize. This was uh, this week um, is the NASCAR Champions uh, Banquet in Nashville. So uh, it's fun to have everybody um, from our sport here in town, but there were some, there are some scheduled events on top of this. So I'm gonna be able to stay for a while and then I will have to um, slide out, but I have other individuals here if there are uh, questions that come up later that we're happy to answer or get answers for you. Um, again, we're thankful to be able to continue this conversation and uh, we'll move to that first slide, Laura, if you don't mind. Um, really touching on the history. Obviously, this, this group knows it, but um, the Fairground Speedway is the second longest continually operating racetrack in the country. Uh, such a tremendous history here in Nashville and such an icon within the sport or within motorsports. And obviously, this group also knows the current facility um, is in a bit of uh, urgent need. Um, it has struggled since NASCAR left here 35 years ago and um, certainly in need of some improvements. And we really uh, believe that it's tremendous uh, potential that has been unrealized up to this point. Uh, last, a few weeks ago when the mayor's office did their presentation, uh, listed many of these reasons, um, but they bear repeating this uh, does allow for a more robust operation. Um, in the past, it's been a smaller operation with limited resources and revenue. Um, as you know, the referendum in 2011 that supports uh, maintaining the speedway and the fairgrounds, uh, Metro owns and has that legal obligation for maintaining that facility and ensure racing continues. Uh, revenue from the Speedway has been insufficient to cover the maintenance and those operating costs resulting in that um, challenge. And facility continues to be in decline, as we've mentioned. Uh, other Metro priorities have left this, uh, left no revenue for basic maintenance and capital needs. Those have been a struggle to get. Um, and until now, there's really not been a holistic plan, a long-term plan to address this. And uh, we believe, a, and working with the mayor's office and um, Laura and the chair that we've been able to develop that long-term plan that's needed. Bid on Speedway Motorsports. Um, we are leader in the industry in building and maintaining facilities. And we have 12 facilities around the country that we operate um, and have been in business uh, for over 60 years. And those stretch from uh, as you can see on the screen, from Sonoma, California, uh, to Las Vegas, all the way up to Dover and New Hampshire, uh, down to Charlotte and Atlanta and all, all between. 
and just the this will give you just a kind of synopsis of the general uh, terms of this deal. We'll dive into the more detail, but overview. This is a 30 year lease term uh, would be with Bristol Motor Speedway. We would oversee renovations and assume daily operations. Uh, we would uh, in the agreement uh, agree to coordinate with Laura and the fair board and all the other uses on property with local racing, regional fair, flea market, uh, obviously with soccer and others. Uh, we commit in this agreement to hosting a NASCAR cup race every other year. Uh, BMS will cooperate with the fairground stakeholders through that scheduling process. We've spent quite a bit of time working with the chair and Laura on that, along with uh, MLS and mixed use and feel good about it. Renovations are going to be funded through a combination of, of streams, a grant from the state of Tennessee, a grant from NCVC, obviously Bristol Motor Speedway investments, revenue bonds issued by the Sports Authority. And those revenue bonds will be repaid by a combination of guaranteed revenue streams and the rent payment uh, and the revenue that's generated on the property by use of the facility. And as you'll see, uh, this is really a partnership and it's, it's different than what you'll see with other sports entities or venues that are built uh, currently because this is a long time venue that there's an obligation with Metro um, to continue to operate. So what we've worked hard on is really building a business model that can be a win together. That's really a partnership and still allow some of those challenges that have been there, those obligations from the taxpayer and Metro and put those on, on the operator. Um, this is a long time uh, contract, as we mentioned, and has been a staple in the community. Top photo there will show you some of the types of uh, events that will be going on. Obviously the banquet set up. So with that, we view this as really kind of a three-legged stool, if you will. There are private events. Um, that'll be taking place. So those community events, the business partnerships, um, luncheons, product launches, that type of thing, as well as NASCAR race and local racing. And then the other being other types of public events. So uh, monster trucks events, uh, supercross, that type of thing. The business model we're presenting um, really has proven success and proven, it's a proven approach. You can look across the country at what we do at our other facilities. So at Las Vegas, um, Texas, uh, Sonoma and the like, we've, we do this type of thing at other places and feel confident in um, the tremendous opportunity that is here. So you've seen this rendering again, this is just uh, that. It is just a rendering, it's conceptual, but we'll show the general um, direction that this design would head. Obviously, if you'll um, look at the picture there, number one that we've heard loud and clear from the beginning is this sound sound wall. That's an important piece of this and as a staple, it must, must be part of the design. Uh, you obviously would also have an increase in the grandstand size. Um, we would work to enhance the infield to make it more usable, not only for uh, motorsports events, but for all events that are on the campus, uh, video boards, other uh, things for the fan experience. You'd see two buildings uh, in turn four, one on the outside and one on the inside, and then the tunnel being another important piece to that, uh, that really allows this to connect to the rest of the property uh, and be used here in this expo center and others. Uh, renovation funding, um, again, this will come from several different sources. Upfront money, uh, as you'll see here on the screen, is state uh, contribution, CVC, us, and then revenue bonds. And then you've got your guaranteed revenue, which is uh, really through contracts with us and contracts through CVC. Uh, you do see a TBD there on the revenue bonds, and that's because uh, as you'll hear a little bit later, as we go through this design process, we're going to identify that number um, so that there's no speculation around that. And then the operational revenue streams will be used to repay those bonds. 
as well as the guaranteed revenue that that'll be touched on. So you see the guaranteed revenue streams with sponsorship. Um, there are four revenue streams that are, a, three of them are guaranteed. And then the one with sponsorship, we consider essentially guaranteed because it's, you guys uh, will receive first dollar for that. So first $600,000. So we'll pay an annual rent of $1 million that increases at 1% escalator. Uh, that's guaranteed. We'll also pay in a uh, guaranteed amount to the fair board. There's an NCVC guaranteed amount that they're going to pay of uh, $650,000 per year to the, um, to the project. And then the first $600,000 of all sponsorship revenue that's uh, for the facility will be dedicated to this with a 1% escalator. Um, and the sponsorship revenue, really, as you look at our business model, sponsorship's a huge part of our business model. So um, that's why I say the $600,000 is essentially guaranteed because we're, we're in the business of selling sponsorship and generating revenue, and you guys will get the first 600000 of that. And then you see there, um, when you add those together, um, obviously from our guaranteed rent payment, um, the fair board guaranteed payment, the NCVC payment, that totals to 57, a little over $57 million. And then when you put in the sponsorship revenue, um, it brings it to $78 million over the life of the contract. So some of the projections that you'll see in a minute and some of what this uh, agreement um, is based upon in late 2021, um, as you guys know, these conversations have gone on for a long time. Uh, Metro engaged CSL Consulting um, to basically evaluate the financial projections in this entire project. Um, and when they did that, they came back with what we felt like was a very conservative perspective. Um, but we respected it. And following that, we went back to the table with the mayor's office and and made adjustments so this thing continued to work, uh, even with, again, those conservative uh, projections. Um, increasing our rent payment, following that, uh, we moved for a NASCAR race every two years instead of every three, reduced uh, the use of the entire property from four weeks to three weeks. Um, and then, again, the financial model illustrated for these categories will reflect those, again, what we feel like were conservative projections. So the revenue models, the revenue projections are based on the types of events. So uh, if you go through the list here, this 10 race weekends are considered in those revenue projections. One NASCAR uh, cup or all-star race every two years. Um, the years we're not doing that all-star race, we would be having, or a cup race, we would be having an Xfinity paired with trucks. Uh, continue to have regional races as well as local races, and those would be combined. Uh, it says four regional and five local, but as you guys do now, um, and as I've mentioned before, we, continue, we plan to continue to work with Bob um, and track enterprises. There would be local racing that would occur during those regional races as well. Um, 20 test practice days, which is a reduction from the current 25. Um, again, there's uh, two music events is contemplated in these revenue projections, uh, one monster truck or some type of show along those lines. Uh, holiday event days were contemplated in there, car show. And then um, with these projections, they've contemplated 75 private event days. The other thing with that that we experienced at our other tracks, um, even though the one thing on the private events is those are private events. So that would that would be probably a few hundred people using a room at the facility um, wouldn't be impacting the community, anything like that. Most folks wouldn't even know what was going on. Uh, in our conversations with the CVC, one of the things they shared with us early on was when you design this facility, if you can design it in such a way that we can host 500, 600 people in a, in a room to where it doesn't feel like every other banquet facility in the country, we would uh, 
see great value in that. So that's part of what we've contemplated here. The second thing with that is it says 75 event days. Um, those may be taking place at, more, at the same time. So um, that's really just used for financial projections. It doesn't mean 75 separate events. Um, at some of our facilities, we'll have three or four events going on at the same time. Get my glasses on so I can see this next page. Lots of little numbers up there. <laughs> and you guys, I should have said this before, but you have this, you have this, uh, a copy of this with you. Um, what that represents are the projections based on the use of facility. Again, this is um, there at the top, you'll see 5% of gross revenue um, that will come back into this uh, food and beverage revenue that is generated. Um, and those are for all events during the 48 weeks, other than the four significant uh, weeks that are contemplated in the contract. And then the other column there is facility sponsorship, ticket tax and sales tax. And those revenues are generated um, on all events, 52 weeks a year um, on the property going back to this project. Again, the projections that we have on there, if you run that to the end of the 30 years, that's about $152 million. So based on the current commitments, uh, guaranteed payment, projected revenues, um, this is for the total generated over the 30 year term of the lease. Pays debt, this creates a debt service reserve of 120%, which was uh, a, something that we had to commit to uh, being able to accomplish. Funds that um, capital repair and replacement and fund provides also for excess payments to the fair board. If you total all those uh, together, it's $268 million, a little over. So again, we're excited to partner with you guys um, on this project. The advantages of this partnership, we believe will benefit Nashville uh, and the fairgrounds for years to come. And we also believe, as we've touched on before, this restores this historic Nashville landmark to a first class facility, completes the overall picture of this wonderful campus that you guys have developed here on the fairgrounds, uh, improves the community quality, we believe, um, by significantly reducing that noise and that impact on the community, as well as the financial benefits and removing that burden uh, from Metro to a private operator. It's what we do on a daily basis. Uh, so that concludes um, our presentation for this part. Uh, we are excited again to continue this conversation. I thank you so much for all the time that you guys have spent on this and we will continue to spend um, as we evaluate this. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman and uh, Laura for your, all your time on this project. Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do now is open the floor to any of the commissioners who have questions for Mr. Caldwell at this point. The order that I will call upon you, I will call upon Vice Chair Hendricks first, followed by in alphabetical order because I am CDO, is, you know what CDO is? It's OCD alphabetically. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Avila, Commissioner Hartley, Commissioner Owens, and then finally I'll ask any questions that haven't already been asked. So I'll start with you, Commissioner Hendricks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. I did have a couple of questions just based off of this presentation um, here. I noticed that in the revenue projections, it starts in 2024 uh, and we're now rounding out 2022. How long do you anticipate construction uh, happening and will the track be unoperable during that time uh, while it's under construction and do you see it in like 2024 really realistically no i think that was those projections were again done starting back in early 2021 we were hoping to be a little further along by now um i think realistically if we depending on how long all this takes but if realistically we're able to wrap something up in um by the end of first quarter second quarter of next year um uh, we believe that it's possible to be operational by 2025, maybe not January 1, 2025, but somewhere in there. Okay. So you. no, we would move to 25. Uh, However, I do think it's possible to run events while we're under construction. Uh, not all events are going to work, but there may be some where if we're able to 
um, through the construction project, address the infield first, again, depending on timing. One of the things we've talked about with Laura, we've talked about with Bob and others, we want to try to d disrupt as little as possible, uh, especially local racing. So if we're able to um, work on the infield and get that done in a time where it wouldn't impact local racing as much and then we could move to the outside, we could allow possibly racing to continue on the inside. Um, maybe with a temporary grandstand on the outside for people to be able to see it. But we'll, we'll dive into that. Really, it really will be impacted by timing. All right, thank you. And then uh, my next question would be about, oh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> the, there's a clause in the contract, uh, it's about terminating the development agreement and lease if the uh, improvements project budget exceeds available funds from the state, the CDC, and the Sports Authority. Um, is that a, a um, uh, something that cannot be discussed? Like, I, I'm concerned because the concern will be we'll be in the middle of construction, price goes up, and then you say, oh, well, well we're not going to finish this because it's going to be it's too much. Right, and I could let the lawyer speak to that more specifically, but that that is earlier in the before we move forward is when it's saying it can be terminated. So once we all agree we're moving forward, so once you would can start start construction, there wouldn't be any termination after that. We would be pulling the trigger and moving forward. Okay, and then I had a question correct, about Tom. significant event weeks uh, and 100% revenue. Uh, could correct. that be negotiated? It has been. I mean, we've gone back and forth. That's one of the reasons we upped our rent to guarantee the money on the other side. Okay. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, yeah, thank you. So, a few questions. The one, the first one I'll ask, especially as you, as you, um, as we discuss events. So, trying to decipher this in terms of the events that we have. Mm -hmm. Oh. On the events that we have, um, and especially around sound mitigation, um, you mentioned some of the smaller events, but then there's also these uh, monster truck uh, cross motorcycle racing. Um, is the plan that all of them will abide by the sound? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the... The other question, I don't know if it's the time to ask for it now, but um, going back to Commissioner Hendricks' uh, comments, right? I'm, I'm struggling with these financial projections that, uh, you know, we, we come here every month and we keep hearing from the rest of our developers as to how prices continue to increase. So I'm just really struggling to look at these numbers given outdated financial projections. Um, and so I don't know if there's a, a thought of updating those numbers um but when i hear every month that the price keeps going up and up and it's it's nothing like it's been seen before i'm just really struggling with with the financial projections right well and these financial projections are on the revenue side not the not the construction building side uh, it's one of the reasons we've designed this process the way we have um to get this conversation going and make sure that that we have an agreement we can all live with and then before we move forward um, and you're going to hear in a minute as they go through the process we're going to start the bidding process now so we're going to come up with hard bids uh, from builders so that before we pull the trigger before any of us move forward with what we're building we know exactly what it's going to cost us and that's on the expense side and that's something that any overages on that would be covered. Would be on us. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Hartley. Thank you. Uh, number one, Mr. Caldwell, thank you for your presentation. It's very helpful. Um, so I have two jobs in my day job. One, I'm a, uh, an executive with the Country Music Association, which means I am in the event business. I'm very excited uh, to be in the event business in Nashville. It's a wonderful 
uh, place. So a lot of that is built on positive relationships, uh, working together. That's how a lot of event work happens. My other job at CMA is I'm CMA's general counsel and I'm a transactional lawyer. And in that role, I often want to ask uh, not just what the relationship will hold, but also what is the guarantee. So I'm gonna ask a couple questions and if it's appropriate, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Weiner, I, I would love if, if Director Cross also wants to chime in. He may be speaking later as well. But what I'd like to do is ask you sort of what Bristol's plan is and then also ask for uh, Director Cross to tell us what the backstop of what the transaction actually says, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so with that, I think the primary type of feedback that I've received a lot of feedback from the community already. Um, I'm sure you guys have as well. Uh, and they fall into three buckets for me. One, uh, which Commissioner uh, Weiner already touched on, is sort of the schedule to go through approval of the, the documents. There's a lot of, not so much um, concern, but just sort of lack of information in the community. So I know we're going to talk about that uh, at a separate time. So that's one. Two, get a lot of uh, questions and concerns about uh, the cost to the, the, the regular Nashville. And obviously we have another big project in town that's taking up a lot of oxygen, but it's sort of put that top of mind for people. And then three, I've gotten a lot of feedback from neighborhood associations, especially about community impact, specifically parking traffic and noise. Those the, you, we all know this. We all know this is like the landscape of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna hit on some of those points. First, you showed a slide and, and I'd love to pop it back up if we can, that shows the number of events that you anticipate to support the revenue projections in the transaction to make the deal pencil. Mm -hmm. And so I think I know what your answer to this is, which is what you anticipate doing is probably that at a minimum. But my question is, what is the maximum number of events? And I'm going to define that broadly, activations of all sort that the uh, facility could be used for under the, the transaction we're contemplating. And the reason I'm asking that is a lot of the community feedback we've gotten is how does this compare to what the feedback, the fairgrounds is being used for today? So I'd love to kind of have a side-by-side -side comparison of what the fairgrounds are being used for today, what we anticipate to support the revenue projections, and then what's the maximum allowed usage. So that's a really hard question to answer, but I'd love for you guys to kind of flesh that out a little bit about what the allowed uses are. Do you want to touch on that? I mean, it's. You're not on. He's turning it on. Can I give him one? Do you want to use this one? Yeah, All right, we'll just switch. We'll just switch mics. Yeah, not not sure what's going on there. Um, so. There are limits in the contract for the number of racing and speedway specific events. So, so events with practices with race cars, race events, there aren't limits on the number of other events that they can hold. And it's, you know, there's always some tension here between protecting the interest in the community and not having the facility overused. But on the other side of the pulling them in the other direction is the more it's programmed, the, the more likely it is to be financially successful, which is in Metro's interest as well as, as Bristol's. So just, I think, I've, I think I hear you on that, Director Cross. We have limits on uh, certain, qual certain types of racing events, the 10 weekends a year, which is defined and has some defined terms in the contract. Everything else is essentially unlimited to the amount that it would be prudent to program this type of facility. Obviously, you don't do an event every day because you have load in, you have load out. It takes a while to set these up. And secondly, the more we program it, the better we do on the revenue side, but potentially we have more community impact. Correct. Is that a fair summary of what you said? Yes. And then I think the, the other piece of that is really the, the agreements that we've talked about with Laura, where for large public events, we're all going to have to work together. We're going to have to work with soccer uh, with the events that will be going on here on the Expo Center. So there will just be a, um, there's a limit to the possibility of what you can do. Uh, I think a, a piece of homework, and I'd maybe su suggest, Laura, you, could, you can lead on this, is I think it'd be good for us to look at our current uh, sort of committed uh, schedule 
and create, not so much for my benefit because I think I can figure this out, but I think it would be very valuable for the community to see what are our current commitments. We've agreed to do this many events today. This is what Bristol prepares or is planning to do, and this is what the maximum allowed is. I think that would be very helpful to our community to see that and would give a lot of comfort to what's, and maybe even a line in there that sort of says, you know, what's Bristol could do and then what is maximally reasonable, even if it's not the limit of the contract. I think that would be very valuable for us to see, and I would love, uh, Director Womack, if you could take the lead on preparing something like that. Commissioner Hartley, I did ask her to add soccer in there because they're part of the mix. Yeah, I think absolutely. Uh, maybe another column that shows sort of other tenants' uses would be would be valuable as well. And the reason the reason for that, uh, Mr. Caldwell, as you know, is, or, or you may not know, but I, I expect you know, is that, you know, there are, there are certain events that are limited the, the the ten race weekends a year, and then there's sort of events that we be, we all believe have would have limited impact, things like the private meetings. But there might be a middle category there where we might differ in opinion about whether that has an impact on the community. So sure. I think just seeing those would be valuable. Okay. Yes, that's fair. Let me just add one thing. Um, I want us to be mindful of consistency across the different folks that are leasing from us, whether it's Flea or Expo or <coughs> Soccer or Bristol. And so to that end, I would like to add in there that we take a look at um, a comparison of what the obligations are from Soccer um, in this same area, you know, do they have limits? Um, are they are they specific to a concert versus a soccer game? Um, and so let's let's just take a quick look at that also, so that there's continuity for all of our lessees. I didn't mean to step on your meeting, but go ahead. I live in your world, Commissioner. <laughs> uh, Mr. Call, I guess my next sort of big question is we, we talked about the revenue streams to support the, the cost of the project. Um, and I think just to make sure we're all on the same page, we have some really good obligated revenue streams that look really good on paper. Um, so again, back to the relationship and then the guarantee, I, I, feel, I feel like those are actually really good solid re revenue streams and I com commend the Metro Legal and the mayor's office for driving a hard bargain. Um, they have done that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's our elected and appointed officials. We expect that. So my, my next question is, just for sake of clarity, though, if there was a failure of the revenue streams to cover the debt payments, who is liable for the delta there? I'll let Tom's. Oh, sorry. This is really just me talking to Director. <laughs> OK. Uh, this, this may be a little bit of a long-winded answer, but the, uh, the, the shortest version is the agreement contemplates a, a, a waterfall. Yeah, I'm sure you've reviewed it, where, where the revenues get, get paid out. Re and revenues come in and they get put in certain accounts and they get paid out in accordance with the terms of this waterfall. The first layer in the waterfall is to debt service, and the second is to a debt service reserve fund. There will be a debt service reserve fund in the amount of the highest debt uh, payment that could be due in any year in the lease. And so, number one, debt service, number two, debt service reserve fund. So we should have at least a year of, of uh, cover, debt service coverage at all times. So you have, you have at least a year before you, before you had any serious trouble. Other than that, um, you know, if there, were, if there were some unforeseeable catastrophe, you know, and the revenues were just short, after after the guaranteed rent and all that, then Metro is on the hook. Metro is going to provide a guarantee to the bonds in the form of a non-tax revenue pledge, which is effectively just about everything other than real estate taxes. And by, uh, one other one other comment, and I'm sorry to ramble a little bit here, the the revenues are expected to be and part of the deal is that they must be equal to 120 percent of what the debt service is will be so uh, 1.2 times coverage on the debt if that makes sense and another way to say that just to rephrase it back in sort of my framework is at the end of the day 
Metro is backstopping the debt. Uh, however, um, Bristol believes strongly that they can they can provide enough by the fixed revenue payments and the variable revenue payments that we feel comfortable that we are covering the debt uh, or that we're covering the likelihood of a default for lack of the correct term there. Yes, that's correct. And it isn't just it isn't just Bristol's projections. The reason why we had the CSL report done was to validate those variable revenues particularly. And um, I was going to get to this. I think 100 percent of my thunder will have been stolen by the time I get to, to my part of this. Uh, the, the CSL report that you got led to additional negotiations with Bristol, which Mr. Caldwell mentioned. And the net effect of that was to lower the scope of Metro's commitment to match those CSL revenues. So we're not basing the, the, what, what the bond issue is going to be on Bristol's projections, but instead on CSL's conservative projections in Bristol's view. Thank you. That's very helpful. And I could I could see that in the deal paper, the, the changes, but just, well, uh, actually taking a step back, one thing that I think would be helpful, especially for the community as they sort of take in this deal, which again, we should stop and say like, this is a, this could be a really great thing for this neighborhood, but it's also a really weighty proposition for a lot of people. I mean, it's a 30 year, very large redevelopment. It's, it's scary for a lot of people. So I think making people feel comfortable is going to really help all of us. So I think one other thing that perhaps another piece of homework, and this might be something Laura uh, or Director Womack, can we suspend the rules and use first names, Sherry? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps with uh, Director Cross is, I know over at the East Bank Committee, we have a great waterfall chart that shows how the debt is applied. This is not as complex as that, but I think a visual representation of how the uh, the revenues come in and then are are sort of applied on a one page would be very valuable to be able to socialize how this deal works in the community. Is that something we could work with? Is it already exists? Okay. It does. It does exist, and that's actually one of the things that I was going to ask Tom to go into awesome. a little bit greater detail. One thing I want to do, we have a couple of other people that are going to be presenting to us. So um, if we can maybe put this on hold, let him do his presentation since he's in the computer here, and then we'll pick this back up. Do you have time? Okay. Thank and, you. And thank you for that. And I apologize for going on. I just, no, it's okay. I think it, to me, it's, it's like good. a brainstorming session. We're just kind of fleshing the That's why we're here. Too. That's exactly why we're here. But I want to give him an opportunity. I want to give John an opportunity because what that's going to do is give us comprehensive information that we can start really digging in and asking really good questions. So with that said, I am going to ask Laura. We're going to do uh, Mr. Pepitone first. So let us call on Mr. Pepitone, who is the senior economist with a group called Tourism Economics, and he's going to discuss the economic impact of the Bristol proposal. And then I will move on to Mr. Cooper, and then we will come back to the table. Okay, thanks. Okay, we're having some technical challenges. I am going to, Greg is on here. I'm going to put my microphone down by the laptop, so I hope that you guys can hear. Um, we'll certainly have this recorded, so if you do miss anything, uh, it will be on YouTube where our normal um, recordings are. But I am going to turn it over to Greg. And Greg, you are up. Great, and thank you, everyone. I am going to... Um share my screen. Would oh, that be don't helpful? Do that. Nope, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> nobody's going okay. to nobody's going to see it. Um, no one's going to see it. I, I have will... I have your slideshow up and on display. So you just tell me next slide. Perfect. Yep, we can certainly do that. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Greg Capitone and I'm a senior economist at Tourism Economics, and I focus on conducting impact studies for the sports, event, and entertainment sectors. And prior to joining Tourism Economics, I was a manager in PwC's um, sports advisory practice. So today I'm going to go through 
the methodology that we use to conduct um, this economic impact study and then review the results for the the analysis so the impact over the 30 years as well as the one-time impacts related to the construction so if you could flip to to the second slide here this shows our economic impact model framework so similar to all other sports or entertainment type of impact studies we conduct we start with the direct business sales and this is the direct spending that is generated 100 percent due to the operations of the facility and so this is generated in in two separate ways so you have the operational spending and so this is the money that is spent to sustain the operations of the fairground speedway, as well as the events that are taking place throughout, um, throughout the venue. And so this could include salaries and wages. This could include any type of professional fees, accounting, you know, security, food and beverage costs, et cetera. The second way that uh, direct spending is generated is by visitors that are coming from outside the county that are attending an event at the fairground speedway they will be spending money in the local community on lodging on retail on recreation entertainment transportation and so this off-site spending by those out-of-town attendees is a form of direct spending in addition to attendees spending in the local community there's also race teams that are going to be coming from out of town spending in the local community as well as other industry stakeholders uh, whether that's nascar or other sponsors uh, that will be spending at at your local establishments this off-site spending excludes any sort of of local spending so if a local uh, goes to a nascar race and purchases dinner before that's excluded from the analysis because we account for the substitution effect so this direct business sales is then input into an input output model and we use implan which is a nationally recognized input output model and it's specifically for davidson county and what that does is it gives us the total economic impact and this includes the direct business sales but also the indirect and induced business sales and so those indirect business sales are supply chain uh, impacts. So a concession stand, for instance, at the venue has to buy food and beverage from a wholesaler, a local wholesaler, that would be a, an indirect impact. And then you have the induced impacts, which are the employee spending impacts. And so anyone that's employed either in a direct industry or one of those indirect industries, they would earn a wage from that job and then spend a portion of that wage in the local economy. And so that's an indirect, an induced impact rather. So when you add those direct, indirect and induced, you get the total economic impact. And we see this in terms of total business sales, as well as number of jobs, the wages associated with those jobs, and then the fiscal or the tax implications. So if we move on to the next slide, this is going to show the annual impacts over the 30 year period. So this is the impacts that are generated on an annual basis um, over the 30 year term. And so on the left hand side of the screen, just focusing on, on those big numbers there, shows that direct spending. So that's that first step in the methodology. And you can see that uh, we estimate that there would be $5.3 billion over the 30 years that would be spent in, in the local economy. And this is broken down by uh, approximately 900 million in the local operational spending. And then the remainder, that 4.4 billion, would be offsite spending by, by non-local attendees, non-local uh, race teams, media, et cetera. So we would put that $5.3 billion of direct spending into that input output model. And it yielded $8 billion in total economic impact. And so now I'm shifting over to the right hand side of the screen uh, to show those total 
economic impacts. And this $8 billion in total economic impact will help to support approximately 2,700 jobs on an annual basis. And so this includes both full-time and part-time jobs. And it includes jobs that are at the venue itself, but also in the local community. So that includes jobs um, in the tourism industry, lodging, you know, retail, restaurants, et cetera. But it also includes jobs that help to support those direct businesses. So if you think of um, professional service firms or financial service firms or insurance agencies that sell their services to these local businesses. So this impact goes beyond just that, those tourism related jobs. And we anticipate that this $8 billion in economic impact would generate over 800 million in state and local tax revenues. And then moving on to the next slide, this one focuses on those one-time capital expenditure impacts. So this would be a, a one-time impact due to the renovation of the existing facility. And so on the left-hand side there, you see that there's anticipated costs of, of $87 million to, to renovate the facility. And when that is input into the input-output model, it yields a approximately 146 million in total economic impact. And this would support 730 jobs throughout the entire construction process and would also generate $4.6 million in state and local tax revenues. And so that is, that's all I have for, for you all today. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to, to answer any questions that, that you might have. I will open the floor to any of our commissioners. Commissioner Hendricks, do you have any questions? Not at this time. Commissioner Avila? Not at this time. Todd? I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Pevitone. I think my only question is, so Art, the, just to roll up, the point of this presentation is to show us essentially what the value of this uh, renovate or this, this the project, the new facility would be over a 30 year period uh, to the community. That's the point of, of what we're looking at. And I just wanna make sure I'm following that correctly. Yes, that's correct. It's, it's gonna show how the, the facility will generate some additional spending in the local communities and the, the jobs and the fiscal implications of that spending. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we will now introduce Mr. John Cooper. Thanks, John is with the law firm Waller, Lansden, Dorch, and Davis. He represents Bristol, and he is going to address our renovation design process. John. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the invitation. I wasn't sure I would ever get to present to the Fair Board again, so this is a, it's a, good to be back. Um, I've also not done a presentation with bass in the background before, which is <laughs> exciting, so... Uh, so I'm going to talk. Br okay, great. I'm going to talk briefly about the procurement process that will be followed and the collaboration and communication with the fair board during the process. Um, so this is a public facility. Obviously, it's owned by the government. So therefore, we must go through a public procurement process. That means that we can't. Bristol can't just choose who they want without going through a, a public. Uh, procurement process. So we're going to follow the requirements of the Metro Procurement Code as if Metro was procuring this project. So we will essentially be acting uh, kind of not as an agent, but, but similar to a purchasing agent who's go going through the process and following Metro's requirements. Uh, Bristol has decided to use the design build method for uh, completing the project. And if you'll go to the next slide, um, this means that the designer, the, the architect design team and the contractor 
uh, are selected at the same time. So they will, uh, an RFP will go out and they will submit proposals uh, that includes both the design phase and the construction phase. And this is good because it results in a guaranteed maximum price, which as uh, Mr. Caldwell was talking about, that's when we'll know whether it's, it's go or not is based on, on the, the GMP. Uh, this is a very common, uh, I've done a little bit of research on this uh, from an industry standpoint and the design build method is uh, more and more common. And I actually had, saw a CLE, Continuing Legal Education, about it last week. And it seems to be that this is moving towards the preferred uh, source selection for, for these type of projects. Uh, it, it does promote efficiency and collaboration because you, you've got everybody working together on the same team and, and it, it, it results in a better project, keeps things on time and, and within budget. Uh, next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the RFP process. Uh, this request for proposals. And this is used when you need providers or contractors that have a specialized skill or professional type service. So it's not a low bid, you know, whoever comes in lowest gets the contract. It's, it's to select someone of competence and integrity, uh, who has experience doing this kind of work. Uh, so the procurement code requires when you're issuing a, an RFP, you have to put it out. They call it put it on the street. So you, you publicly give notice. Here's the RFP and anyone who believes they are qualified can submit a proposal. Uh, there are strict timelines for responses and it is a very hard and fast, if you don't get it in, you're, you're not considered. There's no wiggle room in the, the Metro procurement process. It's, uh, this is the deadline and you have to meet it. Uh, once the proposals are in, there will be an evaluation committee and that evaluation committee will consist of a fair board representative, Metro representative and Bristol Motorsports. Um, I'm sorry, Motor Speedway. And um, so that they do not actually, they're called an evaluation committee because they review all of the proposals. They're all opened at the same time. Nobody gets any advance notice. It's, it's all, all opened at the same time and, and the pr proposals are reviewed and they are scored in accordance with the criteria set out in the RFP. And the committee will then deliberate and make a recommendation for the, the proposal that they think is best suited for the, for the project. This is very similar to what was done for the Geodis Park uh, construction. That one used a construction manager at risk instead of design build, but the procurement was uh, essentially the same. So then after the committee the evaluation committee meets and chooses uh, the proposal that will be awarded based upon the evaluation factors in the, in the RFP. As I said, this is not a low bid uh, contract. Price is a factor and that is one of the scoring criteria, but it's not the determining factor. Um, so just because you come in lowest doesn't mean you're necessarily going to win the bid. I, the RFP will require that the design builder be very experienced in this type of development um, and working on projects of this scale. So that will, um, that will factor into to the scoring. Once the design builder is selected, they will then procure subsequent construction work using a, a bidding process. So like if you're, you need X amount of steel that is a, here are the, the requirements. We're presenting this to you, submit your bid. And then that is based upon a, a, a low bid. Um, so that for, so for construction materials and uh, subcontracting, things like that, it's all done 
in accordance with the Metro procurement bidding process. Um, I'll touch on minority participation. Uh, Bristol is committed to following Metro's procurement non-discrimination program. This is codified in the, the Metro code. The Metro Council passed it several years ago. Um, it was a comprehensive rewrite of Metro's procurement non-discrimination program. Uh, it added a mechanism for having participation goals, which did not exist in the, the previous code. Um, Metro conducted a, or, or had a disparity study done, which determined that there had been underutilization of minority and women-owned businesses in certain construction areas. And so it allows the business uh, assistance office in the, the procurement division to set goals for particular industries like demolition and masonry and you know what, whatever the, the particular section is that you're, you're looking to bid out. So Bristol is committed to, to follow that. Um, all bidders must show that they have contacted under the Metro Procurement Code, they must show that they've contacted or attempted to contact at least three minority women-owned businesses in that field, if there are some in that field registered with the, the business office. So the, the procurement division keeps a list of qualified uh, minority and women-owned businesses in those particular fields. And, and so uh, the design builder will have access to that and can provide that to the subcontractors who are bidding. In addition, Bristol is going to appoint a, uh, a person experienced in minority contracting and workforce development to oversee this process. So there will be a person, a person or a firm that is selected solely for this purpose to monitor participation and to report to the fair board. Move on to collaboration because I know that's very important to the to the board as as it should be. Uh, Bristol will appoint a project manager who's going to oversee the entire project and communicate regularly with the fair board. I expect that Metro in turn or the fair board in turn will select a project manager to oversee it on behalf of the fair board. And then these two individuals will work closely together. That's how the Geodis Park was done. We had um, Mr. Gobble was, was the, uh, I think the project manager for Metro, was that right? Um, and he worked with Kellen uh, throughout the process. Uh, in addition to the project managers, there will the development agreement, which Mr. Cross is gonna talk about, requires that there be a speedway oversight committee and that committee will consist of the fairgrounds executive director the chair of the fair board and the metro director of finance or her designee who will meet regularly with the project manager during the design and construction process to make sure that those lines of communication remain open and that the development the Speedway Oversight Committee is, is monitoring the development through the process and making sure that everything is being done in accordance with what they have been told. Uh, Bristol will provide monthly updates to Metro, which would be to both Metro Finance and to the Fair Board uh, regarding the pre-development expenses. Uh, Mr. Cross will, will talk about how the pre-development expenses are gonna be funded. Uh, but you will get monthly updates throughout the design process before um, we decide whether to, to go all the way or not. Uh, the development agreement also has minimum design standards that uh, pertain to safety elements, noise abatement, uh, ADA accessibility and NASCAR standards, those minimum design standards are, are that. They're, you cannot go below that. So if there are design changes that um, 
Bristol is working with the Speedway Oversight Committee uh, to, to make, you know, for budgetary reasons or programming reasons or whatever, it cannot fall below the minimum standards that are included in the development agreement, which offers the fair board a level of protection to know that you're going to get a quality product. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I will now open the floor. Jasper. Mario. Yeah, I relax now. Go. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Um, no, not, nothing at this time. Thank you. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Cooper, uh, for that overview. Very helpful. Um, you are always really good at explaining stuff, and this is no exception. And I apologize. I've, I've had a chance at this point to read through the development agreement one time. It was, again, very well written. Good job. But I'm not 100% schooled in all the details. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the guaranteed maximum price part uh, just to make sure I understand sort of the, the order of operation. So I believe, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm going to try to summarize this. We would essentially approve the development documents. Uh, the Metro Sports Authority would also approve the development documents and potentially Metro Council would also uh, approve the development documents. We would then have that committee of Bristol Metro and the Fair Board that would review RFPs. The RFPs would establish uh, what the overall price of the project would be at that point. Is that correct? Correct. Well, Director Cross, please. And, uh, since we're using first names at that, that end of the table, please call me Tom. Yes, sir. Um, do you mind if I clarify that just a little bit? The, the solicitation, the, the RFP that John was talking about, doesn't give you a price for the overall project. What you're going to get is a price for pre-development activities, the, the design and, and pre-construction work that has to go on. You can't, th th nobody could give you a price for the overall project at that point because nothing has been designed at, at that point. But so, yeah, that's who determines the GMP. Yes. Yeah, I did not explain that clearly. And, and, and you yes. may have, but I, I, I want to make sure that you, your question is answered. So you don't get a GMP at the beginning. You get, you get a, a price or a way to arrive at a price for pre-construction services. And through the course of the, of the design process, which the fair board will be able to participate in through this oversight committee, you will get a design that everybody has to agree is, is, is an appropriate design. And from that, you'll get a guaranteed maximum price. Thank you. And so I'm thinking through this, you do the pre-development work, you obviously design the project, you get to see what the cost could be. And I believe all those costs are borne on the front end between the CVC and Bristol payments, correct? That's correct. Okay, so I guess that's good. So we have no liability at that point. We're not in any money. We then get through, we see the maximum potential price. And at that point, we have a committee of Metro, Fair Board, and Bristol that make a go, no-go decision. And if it's a no-go, Bristol can then fund the difference, I believe, above no, that, I'm sorry, that's wrong. You, but, you go ahead and tell me, but, tell me what actually, I said that, wrong Actually, that's there. very close. We will have a guaranteed maximum price, and we should know at that point what all the, all the available revenue sources are. And I should say, one of the things that I was going to address, but it's, I'll do it here since it makes sense, is we don't know exactly at this point how much, what the bond issue could be, because we don't know what the interest rate would be. We'll have to make that decision when we, around the time we get the guaranteed maximum price. You know, as, assumedly it's going to be some, something like what we have now or, or another half a percent or maybe a full percent higher than we have now. But that, that's going to have an effect on, the, on how much we can afford to, to fund because we're not going to go beyond what the revenue sources will support, if that makes sense. So part of this go, no-go decision is, is based on, you know, what, what is the limit of Metro's potential contribution? The other two sources are known. It's, it's the, the state contribution, the CVC contribution. We should at that point be able to figure out what Metro's contribution can be. If there's a gap, then Bristol will have the opportunity to say, we'll, we'll take that responsibility for the gap or no, we're not going to do it. And this is sort of like good government, but we look at the guaranteed maximum price and if Metro says, well, the, the bond issuance can only get to 100 million, the guaranteed maximum price is 120 million, obviously at that point, we say no, and then Bristol says we will either make up the difference or we walk away from the project. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Two more questions, Sherry. One, I think it would be valuable, and perhaps this already exists, um, in this, this aspect as well, 
for the community to see a comparison of the design process as this project is comparing to Geodes Park. I think it's not fair for us to make all uh, everything a comparison to the soccer stadium, but I think it would be helpful to the community to see things like we are uh, advocating for minority uh, business owners, things like that. I think it'd be nice to have a side-by-side com -side comparison, even if it's not exactly apples to apples. I think that would be helpful to sort of make the community feel good about how the, the design process is going forward. So that's sort of a comment. Maybe, Laura, you can sort of lead up on that. And then the last question is again for uh, Tom. Tom, I really appreciate John's presentation. And I'm sure, again, going back to my uh, relationship and um, guarantee model of uh, my career, um, is the description of the bid process that Mr. Cooper described to us just now reflected in the, the uh, governing documents? If I understand what you're asking, it is. Uh, the part of doing a government construction project is there has to be competition at some point on substantive construction items. And as John described, uh, that, that takes, takes place through the, um, in this case, a design builder on Geodis. It was a, it was a CM at risk. But at some point, they seek bids for substantive construction work on trade packages like concrete or steel or whatever it is. And so that, that's in the development agreement that that has to be part of this process, that we know we're getting legitimate prices for the substantive construction work because there'll be competition for it. And there's also a provision in the agreement that prohibits uh, self-help. Like, you, you, you know, they, um, they couldn't just select their, their own people to, you know. So, yes, it has to, everything has to be competitively bid. Thank Mario. you so much. Thank you, Todd. Great, Mario. great questions. Um, just along that line, I think it would be helpful, and I was trying to look back at my notes and from a timeline perspective, right? I think it'll be important if, if possible, and I know it's it's difficult, but we, we threw out, you know, Q1, Q2, 2023 to have some sort of decision made and just ballparking what this timeline looks like so we all know what this what the steps are gonna be to, to get to get to that to get to that point so that also the community knows what we're talking about, right? Uh, Commissioner Hendricks talked about, you know, the the assumptions that are made in a 2024. And I think just readjusting that timeline to where we're at today would be helpful. So sure. all of us could be working around the same time frame. I think that would just be helpful for clarity. Sure. So the, the RFP um, we are working on now uh, under the assumption that, that this is going to at least move to the design phase. Um, so as soon as we have the necessary approvals, we will be ready to issue the RFP. So there will not be any delay there. And then it's just a matter of, of uh, I, I, d I don't know how long it will take to design the project. I don't know if there's anyone from Bristol that can answer that. I, I'm not in that space, so I, I, I don't know. But um, we will move as quickly as possible. Mario, let me ask you, are you asking in terms of the legislative process going through that or just... I, I wasn't, but I think that's also important. And I know we, we've talked about it, but again, from a clarity perspective, as we start to, to hear more from our community groups, I think it would be important just to have that. So that we're all working on, on, a, on a timeline. And again, sure. we're not going to we're not going to set specific dates because this all fluctuates. But I think it'll be important to understand from a legislative, what are the steps? to be clear and then also you know the RFP process if we could get from Bristol a sense of you know from a design how long that will take so that we know are we thinking you know mid 2024 is this you know how long do we think that's going to take just so that we all are on the same page as the timeline does that make sense yeah some some of this you can put a timeline to some of it you just can't I agree and and Tom, do you want to go through it or do you want me to go the through The reason it? I say that is because I know we, I know we, some of it we can or we can't, but I think as we're having conversation amongst mm -hmm. ourselves as commissioners, yeah. but also with the community, what I don't want is for some, it seems like it's happening tomorrow and the bulldozers yeah. are coming in um, and they're not. <laughs> they're not. And so I just want to make sure that we're all talking about at least in general, a similar timeline sure. so that we know so, what, what we're So at. we can, uh, 
we will work to put together a, a, a timeline for you. Um, what I can say is that once the, the, the board here acts and says, yes, this is, you know, go forth with the, the design, the, the council will not have any action un, until we, we get the no go, go, no go decision. And then the necessary legislation will be submitted to the council to authorize the sports authority to issue the bonds and to take what other actions or our legislative actions are necessary. So it, it it's not yeah, yeah, and, and that's, really that's, quick. so for me, I think that's fine. I mean, I think, you know, all the work that the mayor's office has done to put this together and all, everyone included, I think best case scenario, right? What, what are we talking about in terms of best case scenario, what this timeline could look like? I, again, I, I don't need the answer now. I'm just yeah, saying we'll, we'll I, get it, that for yeah, you. it would be helpful. And again, in general terms, so that the public also knows what we're looking at. Okay. Um, and if, if, everything, if everything were to fall in its place, what is that general timeline that the city and Bristol is thinking about if the right approvals came in uh, so that we all just know? Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful. Will do. Todd. Uh, I just wanted to sort of echo Mario's note, and I think it's a good example of this project is, is, a, is a, it's a big project for the community, and I think whatever we can do to increase clarity is going to make it easier all the way through uh, I, I just think that's something we are sort of at a deficit at right now, not for any ill intent. I think it's more just we need to educate and bring up to speed the community and, and frankly ourselves on, on what we're agreeing to here. So I just wanted to echo that. And I also wanted one point of clarification. After we go through, and this is for Tom, after we go through the RFP process and we get the proposals to the evaluation committee, and I may have read this in the documents, but it, tell me if I'm wrong, is is our Metro and the fair board bound to move forward unless there's a, a failure of the bonds in the sense of, can we, we can we being that being Metro, can Metro withhold its consent to move forward for any reason, or is it more of a not to be unreasonably withheld kind of situation? And the reason I'm asking is if it's just whether the deal pencils at that point, it changes sort of how much evaluation is needed now versus if it's, that's really a substantive second decision we should approach it in a different way. Again, I, I'm not 100% sure I understood what you're asking, but let me take a shot at it and then I'll, I'll keep going if I didn't get there. Until the council and the, and the fair board and the sports authority have all approved documents definitively, then Metro is not bound. And that is not going to take place at the, at the stage when an RFP has been issued and a, a design builder has been selected. Um, Bristol understands that they're taking a, a, something of a risk here in proceeding before they have all those approvals, but they, they feel confident that they can, you know, they, can, they can get a head start here and do some work in parallel with this approval process. And I guess following, you know, we have the documents in front of us, but we don't know the maximum price of the pro project until we get through the RFP process. And so what I'm trying to figure out is we approve the documents, we go through the RFP process, and then we see that the project comes back is the only reason the member of the fair board who's on this evaluation committee can say, no, we don't want to move forward, is that the revenue projections don't cover the debt service or can at that point you say no for any reason? At, at that point, I think the expectation is the fair board will have approved the documents. So it's, it's going to be at that point in the hands of the council and the, and the sports authority whether, whether to proceed or not. So yes, I think, I think that the, the opportunity for the fair board to make a determination about whether this is a project it wants to pursue is at this stage. Thank you, that's, that's really helpful. And just to close that point out. So the idea is, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing, I'm just sort of restating it. We should, we should look to our job as to approve these documents without knowing the actual price of the project, what we're relying on is that uh, we're, we're making the decision based on seeing the potential revenue projections uh, versus, I mean, we don't have a cost number, but we're sort of trusting that another arm of the Metro government would say no at that point if the revenue to cover the build isn't matched by the revenue coming into the project from use of the facility. That's correct, and okay. that is built into the documents. Yes. Thank you.
Any other questions before I go? Okay. So, yeah, I'm an audiologist, and because I'm an audiologist, I do a little bit of research. You want me closer? Okay. I do a little bit of research. And in my research, of course, it was related to the sound, and I got to thinking, well, there may be some things that we've missed. Let me just look a little bit further, and because I know this much about racing, I wanted to make sure that I had went to more of a NASCAR source. So what I found really kind of surprised me, and there was an article that was written by a gentleman named Tom Taylor, and the article was dated July 23rd of 22. And in it, it says that NASCAR will begin incorporating electrification at the 2023 Bush Light Clash. Additionally, it's shared, and I'm gonna read this so I don't misstate it. Additionally, it's shared that NASCAR will oversee electric development with the goal of a national series for 2025. The impact on racers, crew, staff, and attendees of repeated exposure to high intensity sound is well documented. Given this knowledge, and this is gonna be, Julie, it may be to you, um, unless somebody else you wanna punt it to. Um, why did I not see that we've incorporated mufflers for all events, including NASCAR, given that this is in the offing, or at least in keeping with the intent of what NASCAR is looking at now, um, at least represent implementation at some later date consistent with NASCAR's um, progress in this area, um, that we would use electric and or hybrid engine technologies by at least, and I think the number they used was 25, 2025. And so um, that was part A of my question. Part B of my question is probably just a statement and not a question. Um, would be when we're looking at the stands, let's try not to do, if this goes through, metal grandstands because they reverberate and it amplifies the noise exponentially and can actually cause more damage to your spectators. Um, I, you know, for me, um, it's just an important consideration given that we want our area residents and um, fairgrounds visitors, as well as the neighbors and the pit crew um, and the people that are staffing these events, um, we want to provide them the safety that they need. So that's my soliloquy on sound mitigation. Julie, grab a microphone, please. Okay. Um, I'll give a quick answer to the first part. Okay. Because Na we don't own NASCAR, we can't commit them to anything. I think what we've said through this whole process is that we're in continuous conversation with them and that it is our expectation and our intention to discuss it with them, but we're not in a position to mandate that they do anything. Um, so I think that's probably the short answer to the first part. With regard to the second part, I'll punt that to the construction people, but I will certainly make sure that it's communicated. While we're on NASCAR, can we talk a little bit about the impact of the sanctioning agreement and where that stands in so far as us moving this forward? I mean, does every racing event get a sanctioning? That's one of the questions I keep getting from people. So can you share a little bit about that? So. That's a hard question to answer mm -hmm. exactly. Um, yeah. NASCAR grants a sanction for whatever events are run under a NAS the NASCAR umbrella. So if they're going to come here, they're going to have to grant a sanction for that. They won't grant it until there's a facility that they can grant it for. Mm -hmm. um, what I can tell you is that NASCAR has expressed, you know, positive positivity about this project. It's easy for me to say, right? Um, and they, you know, but, but we can't commit them to anything. I mean, it's really going to be their decision. Um, I don't think we would be sitting here doing this if we didn't expect, you know, to be able to work something out with NASCAR. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for Julie? That's what I get for walking over here. I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't know Julie. 
Could Julie say who you are? I am Hi. so sorry, y'all. <laughs> Julie, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. I apologize. I am Julie Bennett. I am Vice President and General Counsel for Bristol Motor Speedway. That makes sense. Which is why I called on Julie. Which is why she called Using on a me. first name. This, this is turning into quite a... This is turning into quite a lawyer. I know we get a lot of lawyers at the table now, so... Not it. I'll stay an audiologist. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, let me just share at this point what the goal was in having these work sessions is just this, to get all this information out there. You know, we've had the CSL study sitting out there, but yet there were changes made to the development agreement and the lease agreement um, based on that CSL study. Um, there's a lot more information to come, and I know Mr. Cross now wants to share whatever he hasn't shared yet. There, there's almost nothing in the outline that I provided that we haven't already hit on, and I'm not sure that it would be worth everybody's time for me to go through it. I, I think that Laura has probably provided a copy to you, and I, if, if you happen to have scanned it and seen stuff that you'd like to talk about, I'll be happy to do it. Um, I, I guess it, I, I would sort of like to just talk very briefly about why we, why we have two documents instead of one that are in front of you and how I sort of think about the way the process works. So we have a development agreement and a lease, which is typical for a big project like this. And I sort of think of the, of the, of the, the way the whole relationship works in two phases. And the first one is how do you get the project constructed? What are the sources of money to do it? Who's responsible for what on the construction project and then during the design project? And then after the project is finished, then you start with the, the lease, which defines the relationship going forward after that. We have another work session scheduled to talk about issues in the lease. I know that you'll, you'll probably have more questions about both documents by the time we get there. But the, you, know, you have a development agreement that covers this first phase of things. And in fact, you could think about the development process as, a, as in a sort of a two-phase process too. We, we hit on this a little bit. There's pre-development where somebody's doing design and then so we're agreeing on the, on the design and on whether to move forward or not. And then once you pull the trigger on that, then there's the construction process. And the way the development agreement is structured, the fair board has a very active role in both of those pieces. And of course it will during the lease as well. Um, one other thing that I thought might be confusing is why the, there are all these references to the sports authority, both in our discussions and the leases. And if you look at, at either of these documents, they're not a party. Well, the reason is they have to be involved in the financing of it because under state law, they can issue sports facility revenue bonds and no other metro entity, including the fair board, can. And so I think I mentioned this when we talked a couple weeks ago, that there will be a lease of the property to the fair, to the sports authority and then, and then a lease back. And the lease will be between the fair board and Bristol. So I uh, don't want to waste your time with plowing the same ground in the development agreement, but if you think of questions, you're welcome to ask me now via email or at the next work session. And let me just add, as long as we're talking about questions, and I'll open the floor to anybody again, um, but as long as we're talking about the questions, one of the things that we had discussed early on was just letting the commissioners send written questions to Laura that would then be supplied to Bristol. And one of the things that made sense as well was giving us this opportunity to have a free and open conversation and to ask questions so that people can tune in and um, watch us now or take the recording and sit and digest it as they can. And so for us to be able to continue that process is the reason I set the two work sessions. Um, doesn't mean there are just gonna be two work sessions. I mean, throw another one at you. Um, we're gonna see how this goes and how much information we get and how much more information we feel we need. Um, to that end, if you have questions, and Tom may or may not have the answer, he usually does have the answer, but if he doesn't, you can always um, get with Laura and we can get those questions over to um, Bristol and get those answered. What I would suggest though is if you do that, um, recognize that I will ask that those questions be reviewed during the work sessions as well, okay? So does anybody else have any questions, comments? Yeah, I, I just had a couple of questions and I was waiting. I had them earlier, but I was going to wait the appropriate time. But um, very quickly, uh, the $17 million grant that we speak about from the state of Tennessee was allocated in the budget that the, the governor announced like a few months ago. Is there a timeline on that? 
um, do we have to act? Is there like, is there an expectation that we have to act before the next fiscal cycle in order to get this money? Uh, I don't think we have to act before the next session of the legislature. And John actually might be in a better position to answer this question than I am, but I believe they already have worked out the terms of the grant agreement between Bristol and the state. Yes, so the, the grant was made from the state to Bristol as part of the you know economic development program grant. And so the, the money has been appropriated, the grant has been awarded, so there's uh, no further action needed there. Okay, cool, thank you. And then, Other than spending it. Right. Well, yes. <laughs> and then my next question will be, all right, so it's great that the uh, CVC has um, agreed to chip in and they are, they have verbally agreed to a $650,000 annual rent payment. Is there anything holding them to that and for how long? I don't think I've, we, you know, is it going to be for the full 30 years? It is going to be for the full 30 years, and there is a separate agreement between Bristol and the CVC that covers both the terms of their grant up front and the $650,000 a year in annual payments. And John might could probably elaborate on that too. And that agreement has already been executed, so so the CVC has committed contractually to, to that. Well, thank you. Uh, then there's talk about parking. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Commissioner Hendricks. What? And I, tell me no if you disagree. I had some related questions on CVC. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mind? Can we Go stay ahead. on that topic yep. for just a second? Go ahead. Uh, first, John, I believe that CVC, does that uh, agreement uh, between Bristol and CVC, is that going to be an attachment to the uh, lease agreement? It is. Okay. So can we see a copy of it? Yes. Yeah, we, we, I think we have it already. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. It's not in the packet we have, but I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, we yeah. can get that. And then related to that, uh, a lot of the community feedback or one a piece of community feedback, as we've mentioned, is about limits. We've talked about creating a chart of current uses versus potential maximum uses. And one related question to that is, are there any limits in the agreement about what CVC is allowed to use in the 20 days that they, uh, I believe they're limited to 20 days rented from Bristol are there any limits around what they can use the facility for on those days? I'm sure John knows the, the Bristol CVC agreement better than I do, but there are some limits even in the lease about what the CVC can do. And I, I feel confident they're not going to be holding racing, but. Uh, <laughs> right. Yes. They, they, um, th there are, I, I mean, obviously they can't use it for any purpose that Bristol couldn't use it for. And Bristol's not going to, even if they wanted to do, I mean, they're not going to give one of their race weekends to the yeah. CVC. So, yeah, it it would be more like, as Mr. Caldwell talked about, banquet type events and corporate events and, and, and things like that. Um, I think when we're looking, obviously, at that chart of total impact, potential impact, we need to sort of probably include in Bristol's numbers, the CVC numbers, since they're sort of a subtenant of Bristol, yeah. but probably break that out separately as well. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Hendricks, for letting me jumping in. All right, no problem. And it, so my next question would be about parking, and this could be something that we might have to discuss at another meeting. Um, I'm trying to envision this parking and what the overall um, uh, uh, transportation will be to get to this facility. I have a uh, attended a couple of soccer games um, and have had horrible experiences, uh, both trying to do ride share, which was suggested, uh, and also, you know, driving, you know, trying to park here. Um, we have a 30,000 seat soccer stadium. You're proposing we add another 30,000 seats to a racetrack. Ooh, I don't see any development about parking. I see nothing about, you know, um, how are we looking at getting people from downtown, uh, from the hotels that we think that people are going to stay at to attend an event here uh, with ease. Because uh, I know when I tried to do, when I did the ride share, I could have walked, I live in the Gulch. I practically almost walked home in order before I could get a, uh, a, a, um, a ride out because everybody was confused as to where the ride share uh, situation, and I'm, and I'm talking, when I say everyone, I'm talking about the security. 
that was paid, the police officer that paid to stand out there, uh, was sending all the rideshare people halfway down, um, uh, down, you know, to my way. Uh, and I, before we approve this, I actually would like to see a plan um, about parking and how do we plan to accommodate uh, and what if we do have events on the same day at the soccer stadium and the racetrack, you have 60,000 people, you know, or more that are trying to get here. Uh, what is that going to look like? Um, I, you know, I, I just would like to see something uh, and, and making sure that we're taking a look at that. And then the next thing will be, do we plan to do an environmental impact report? Uh, how is it going, this this uh, this expansion, this area has a lot of flooding uh, that's close to this area. Um, you know, are we taking a look at that? Are we, um, you know, looking at not just noise, but what is it going to do, you know, to the, uh, to the surrounding area uh, when we're looking at this apartment complex that's being built uh, and, um, you know, and everything else. Uh, do we plan to do an environmental impact? So I walked here up here to talk about parking. I'm not sure I'm qualified to talk about environmental impact. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but in terms of parking, we've engaged Kimley Horn um, and kind of they're on pause at the moment because we're waiting to, to get some of this going. But um, the expectation for us is that we will have, first of all, very few, um, I would expect, events that have the full 30,000 people. Um, it's it's kind of not like the soccer where they have a full stadium multiple times. We'll have very few that are actually anticipated to have that many. We anticipate at this point, and this is again to be developed a little bit more with Kimley Horn, but we anticipate having um, some off-premises parking and shuttles. That's what we do at Bristol. Bristol, for example, has very limited parking on-premises, um, so, and we run a pretty robust shuttle system, and I think we anticipate doing something similar here. A lot of the um, NASCAR, uh, especially race event folks, are probably going to be staying at hotels, so we'll, we'll incorporate a shuttle system that'll work for a lot of that. Um, it's not, I mean, it's going to take a little time, but I think our goal is to work similarly to soccer and that's getting better as I understand it. And, and we'll continue to, as people kind of get used to it and um, kind of learn maybe the best way to, to get in and out. Does that answer your question? Okay. Todd. Follow on on Jasper's question. Um, one, just, just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, and this is a super basic question, so I apologize, but when we're talking about the, the facility that we're leasing, we're talking about the racetrack and the grandstands, and I believe, and sort of double check me if I'm wrong, Julie or, or Tom, for the non-significant event weeks, that's, that's what Bristol's controlling, is sort of the grandstands, the new buildings around the grandstands, and the racing surface. Is that correct? That's right. Okay, and then on the significant weeks, those are when the remainder of the non-lease to third-party parts of the fairgrounds come under control of Bristol for those weeks, correct? That's right. And then I see in the, the operating agreement, that's not what it's called, the lease agreement, that we say we anticipate the joint development of a parking ingress and egress plan. Tom, how strong of a sort of requirement is that? And the reason is, is there is a lot of concern in the community about both sort of competing uses, uh, you know, overburdening the, the, the surrounding infrastructure. So how strong of a commitment is that from both, you know, the fair board and Metro side, as well as from the Bristol side to actually develop a plan, or is this more of a ongoing discussions about parking kind of, kind of feel? I, th I think the fair board from its comments takes it seriously. And I know Bristol does too. It's not to their advantage to have a, you know, a anthill out here every time they have an event because people don't want to come and they want they want to be good neighbors. Um, I will say that my own personal observations about the parking for soccer was it did get better and there are always growing pains. You know, you, you can't have 30,000 people drive up and park 100 feet from the stadium. It's just not going to ever work like that. And it's not going to work like that for a 30,000 person event at a speedway either. But it did get smoother as time went on. 
but it's it's Metro's commitment to work on a plan that works and is is uh, doesn't unduly burden the neighborhood. Laura, can you also speak to that as far as I mean, you're going to have to do it. So, you know, what do you what is what is your level of comfort with sort of parking and traffic? Well, so far in our scheduling with soccer, it's been extremely collaborative. Um, and I fully anticipate a similar journey with Bristol as we go through and, and compare schedules. Um, it's going to be a very similar process to what we have been doing over the past year. We've had since May of this year to, you know, open up the stadium. Um, it's we're going to learn more next year because we just, as you know, opened up two major roadways through the campus that were not available for the majority of the soccer season. So I think that is going to be an input that we're going to have to evaluate the effectiveness of those roads to ingress and egress going into the next season. So I do think that we still have more to learn, but as far as the scheduling and cooperation that I've seen from Nashville soccer with us and our events. It's been really, really good. Thank you. Jasper. Jasper, do you have any other questions? I didn't hear it. He's going to save them for next session. I want to save them for the oh, next good. session. Thank you. Um, I do have one more quick thing, if I might. Early on, you were talking about the waterfall, and you went through the first two steps of the waterfall. Can you just run through what the other buckets are? Because there were some questions, some murmurings up here, and I, I just feel like it's important to get that out there, if you don't mind. Anthony, while he's looking, do you have any questions? Okay. So the first two, as we talked about, are the bond debt expense. So we're going to pay pay what we owe out of the out of the revenue, and if that's all there is, that's all that gets paid. The second is to fund the debt service reserve fund. The third is to reimburse the fair board, the authority, metropolitan government for bond debt expense paid from any source. It, for example, if we have to come out of pocket for bond debt expense in some year as a result of some unforeseen calamity then we get reimbursed for that in the third third position in the waterfall. Uh, and this some of this is pretty technical and, we, and it may be that you need to think about it in connection with the lease. But the, but the fourth one is uh, in connection with the deposit to capital projects fund so that there's money available for uh, work that needs to be done to keep the facility in good repair and in operation. This is this is a, a lesson we learned on uh, the, the existing football stadium, that there, that there needs to be a robust amount of money going into that fund annually to pay for it. Um, then, and this uh, needs a little tinkering to, to actually get it right, there's, there's this, an amount that comes to, back to the fair board. There's, uh, we'll go over this again, I promise, when we talk about the lease the next time. There's a guaranteed annual payment to the fair board, and then there's sort of a conditional payment to the fair board in the same amount if the money's there to do it. And that's in fifth place in the waterfall. Sixth, to the authority in Bristol in pro rata in proportion to, to the amounts that they have funded uh, for project costs that bond proceeds did, or the state grant or the CBC grant didn't pay, then a repayment to Bristol for cost overruns that they had to pay during construction. For example, if something happens during the during the construction project and the price comes in over the GMP, which is unlikely but possible that Bristol's on the hook for that. So they would they would get to recover that in that at that position in the waterfall. Seventh, funds remaining in the tax revenue fund paid to the authority. And eighth, there is a split between uh, Bristol and, and the fair board of 75 percent to Bristol and 25 percent to fair board. I will tell you, I, I don't think either party's anticipating there will be much to split at that point. So there's your waterfall and all the buckets. And that's what I wanted to share. Anybody have any other questions? Todd, you look like you have a question. I do. And 
number one, I want to say I really appreciate everybody. There's a lot of experts here, so thank you. I do have, as Jasper does, many more sort of questions. There's all things about the Fair Board operations and how they'll change over time. There's other community impacts, other financial pieces, but this has been a really great first step. Uh, I want to emphasize again some of the documents I've requested us to put together. They're not as much they're in all of our benefit to, to have good documents that we can give out to the public to explain this. We receive questions, many, many questions about this deal and making it explainable and understandable and improving the information gap is going to be very helpful to moving this forward, I, in my opinion. So I really want to emphasize again, and, and Laura, I would please ask you to kind of lead up to get this from the appropriate sources. The, the waterfall you just described, obviously, I know it's in the lease document, but if we can make that in an, sort of a visually understandable form for regular people, that would be very helpful. Two, if we can have, again, that chart of the broadly defined activations of the site versus current uh, use, Bristol's plans, and then the maximum allowed under the, this new deal will be very helpful to explain to people what the impact on the community will be. Third, I haven't brought this up yet, but you know, we've asked previously, and I believe, uh, I think Mr. Eagles is back there, you know, in his presentation, he mentioned that it's in progress, but, you know, we've asked for what it would cost if we didn't do this deal to move this, this facility into a usable shape. I think we still need to get that. And we need to pair that with, you know, again, what are our requirements from Metro law, that being the charter about what we need to do. I know we already have that, but I think we need to have those in hand to make the decision. And then the final one is, again, I think a side-by-side -side comparison of the design process that Mr. Cooper so eloquently described, comparing this process that we're envisioning for this project to what uh, we did for soccer would do a lot to uh, help explain this to the community. So I would request that we have those documents sort of prepared. Uh, no hurry, uh, obviously, just when they're ready uh, would be very helpful. And when we get those documents, we'll make them available to the public as well, for sure. Yeah, I was thinking we could just put them on the, the Fair Board website. Everything's uh, going to go yeah, up there. 100 percent. Everything. And my last note, Cherry. I'm sorry, Laura, go ahead. Yes, you may. Laura. The, uh, I just wanted to ask, can we go over the timeline? Because I know I have a bunch of calendar invites on my calendar. I just wanted to know what sort of our next steps are so that I make sure I show up. And also, I know I'm unavailable for some, so I want to say that out loud to everybody. Uh, so can we just go through our calendar for what the next meetings will be? You are a mind reader, because I was going to do that in a few minutes. But I want Laura to make a couple of statements first. <clears throat> just for the record, I do want to just call out that if you go to Nashville.gov and go to the government tab, and then scroll down to boards and commissions. When you click on that tab, you can go into the uh, fair commissioners board. I believe it's under F. It, they're all listed alphabetically on that web page. Go to the fair commissioners board. Once you go in there, there is a section, if you scroll down, that says related documents. There's a link there on that page that takes you to all of these documents. So they're all in one place. We've also added in not just the documents that, um, you know, like the development agreement, the draft lease, summary pages, but I've also included the section for the sound mitigation study that was done, as well as uh, Chair Wiener's ex explanation of that study, kind of in layman's terms, and then an additional sound map that was presented. So we'll go ahead and put all of those on one page so it's really easy for the public to navigate. Okay, so there are three upcoming meetings scheduled so far. We have December 8th at 5 p.m., which is our first public hearing. We have our second meeting, which will be December 13th, which is our fair board meeting and following the fair board meeting, we will have our second work session, January 5th at 5 p.m. will be our second public hearing. That is all I've scheduled so far. We'll see how this process plays out and what information we have, and then we'll move from there. 
Sherry, I'm just, I'm just going to ask. I mean, on the 13th, I'm out of the country. I would really like to attend the second work session. I think talking to these people, uh, these experts that we have here would be very helpful. Is there any way we can move that Let me check. Out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Let me check. Yeah, I'm going to be out as well. You're going to be gone? Yeah, okay. That day, yeah. Okay. So, Laura will get with everybody and find another date, and we'll shift that as needed. Can you Mario, will you be I'll here? Go, Do you have it? Are you going to be out of the country between no. now and... Okay. Oh, I will be out of the country, but not, I'll be here for that, <laughs> yes. Um, Don't you love my I, humor? I know, I know. Well, it's, 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 it, it, it's very true. I, I do travel out of the country quite a bit. Um, <laughs> can I add just another sure. comment? As I look at, I think it'll be helpful as we think about the sessions and, and listening to the public. Um, I don't think I've seen it. It would be very helpful, I think, as we think about this being metro property, right? And especially as we get ready to hear from the community. Um, we see these revenue projections. We see uses for the facility, right? We have uses for the fair buildings, uses for the soccer stadium. I think what would be helpful is, and, I, and I'm hopeful that, um, that Bristol will be able to provide some of this, is customer personas. Who's coming to these events? Right, we, we had a whole economic study done, but who's actually coming? And so we have these big 10 race weekends um, we have music events, so we should be able to get some of that information. Um, I would just, I think it would be helpful for us to understand who's actually going to be using the facility. And so we're, we're getting ready to, to look at a proposal to renovate this, uh, who's doing it, right? We have data on who's used the facility before, who's coming to see the races. Uh, and I think as much as, as much information that we can on the actual customer profile that we're that this facility is being built for would be helpful, especially on the on the big revenue projection items. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, real quick, uh, just to piggyback on what uh, Mario said, it's I was curious, and I was going to bring it up later about the revenue projections and what is that based on? Because I know we said we're doing a thirty thousand seat stadium, but we just was told that we're not going to have there's going to be very few races with 30,000 people. So where is the money coming from? Like, how are, what, how are we anticipating this revenue? You know, coming in, what is this based off of? What, you know, if, uh, if it's not going to be full, like, what, it, so we're going to say, what, this is 10,000 people that we're basing this revenue off of, and, and, you know, so what if we miss the mark? I mean, I'm just curious about that. Can, if, Tom. if I may, just um, yes. one of the things that's on the website and I think was provided was the CSL report and they lay out what the assumptions are about uh, um, attendance for the various events that are that underlie the model that they used. So they, they expect a place to be packed for NASCAR events and, and not packed for other events, but they, they give uh, projections for likely attendance at the things that, that they're using to project revenues from. Do you have a copy of it? I, I did want to ask earlier on that point, Tom. Uh, Mr. Caldwell put up sort of the delta between the CSL study and the current set of documents. In his uh, PowerPoint, he had a slide on that. Um, I know you don't have the PowerPoint in front of you, but um, maybe I can just walk over to you later and sort of confirm that we feel that that is accurately how the documents have changed since the CSL study. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk to about it whenever you whenever you like but let me reiterate that the scope of metro's commitment in the bond issue was reduced to match what the csl report says are reasonable projections anybody else have any questions at this point todd you look like you have another always, question always i can do this all night i'm just waiting for my kids to go to bed my kids go to bed at seven so i'm just going to keep talking until <laughs> seven o'clock so my wife has to put them in bed the the question is so we have a December 8 public hearing. My, my basic question is, I'm new to this board. You know, I've been to one of these public hearings. What should we expect? What do we expect from the public at that point? Again, as we're talking to the community, they're calling us often. You know, how, how is this, how, you know, how can we make that the most effective use of everyone's time? The way a standard public hearing goes, and we'll have to conduct it the way a standard public hearing goes, is I will ask for a show of hands of those in the audience who support the proposal 
and for those who are opposed to the proposal. I will then ask everyone who is in favor of the proposal and wishes to speak. I will ask them to line up at the lectern and they will have two minutes to share with us whatever their thoughts are at this point. That includes questions, comments, concerns, anything. And then we'll listen to whoever stands up in that line and comes up to speak. And then I will ask for anyone that is in opposition. Same exact thing will happen. Once everybody that is there has had an opportunity to speak, we'll close the public hearing. I just, I just want to make a suggestion. And that's obviously, I mean, I was just looking at the rules. That's literally the rules of a public hearing. And we might do ourselves a disservice to have a public hearing this early because I'll be honest, there's not enough clarity in these documents. We're asking people to take a position and you're going to, you're going to just ossify everyone in the community. It, it, to me, it's almost like we're asking everybody to choose up before they even know what's in the documents. It might be more valuable to have several more work sessions that are highly publicized so that the public can just come hear this communication before asking them to put on the table their position. Uh, we're just going to have a bunch of people that don't know what's in the documents. I mean, respectfully, the public is, I mean, we, we listen to their will, but if they don't know what's in the documents, it's, it's going to be counterproductive to moving the ball forward. So everything that we get is put out in the public eye. And I have set these initial meetings so that we can have questions from the public to us directly out in the public space. So we have a lot of people in the community who have a lot of questions. If they can't get one of us and if we don't have the answer and if we have not been given that information, they have an opportunity where they can come to us and say, this is what I need to know. And that is a lot of times what happens in a public hearing is people just come in and they say, we've got these questions and they give them to us. And then the parties that are involved in the proposal can come back and give us the answers. That's the main reason I set two meetings for public hearing is so that people have that opportunity to do those things. We additionally will have, we won't, but the council will have public hearing as well. So there are gonna be a lot of opportunities for people to have a chance to let us know what they think and what their questions are. And if we need to add more, we add more. But I didn't wanna inundate it with a lot of scheduling so far not knowing how these meetings were going to turn out and what other information we were going to need. You got to start somewhere and that's what we're doing. So, so to clarify and for, for everyone and the public, mm -hmm. in that public hearing, we will hear their comments, mm -hmm. but there won't be a discussion. No discussion. We're just listening to them. That and so, and listening. so I want to make mm -hmm. that clear so that there, there has been in, in previous public hearings, frustration from the community where the commissioners just sit here and listen and there's no response to their objections or interests. And so I just want to clarify that, that for the December 8th public hearing, we're here to listen to the community, take notes, and then in another working session as a group in public, we will discuss that and add it to our line of questioning or pros, cons with the contract, correct? Exactly. Okay. And and a lot of the reason that you have, primary reason that you have a public hearing is it's our job to listen. And this gives us the opportunity to listen. And if we have a public hearing with dialogue, somebody that came to speak and visit may not be heard. And so if we talk, we're not listening. And that's why you have a public hearing set up like that. And so the suggestion for the the com for community members that want to be heard is uh, we get emails, we get calls by the community is in order for that to be on the record, they should attempt to be here at a public hearing Absolutely. or have someone in their place to to express their their opinion. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Anthony, do you have something? Okay. I was just going to back up what he said, but we're good. And I also want to take the, what, they, what do they say, personal point of privilege at this time. Uh, I was late tonight because uh, our high school that I am a consultant at for football, this was our last practice, East High School, East Nashville High School, and we're playing the state championship game on Friday morning against uh, Alcoa. 
at 10 o'clock in Chattanooga. So that's why I was late today. But it was our last practice of the year, and hopefully we can bring home the gold ball to Nashville. <laughs> That'll be great. Any more comments or questions? This work session is adjourned. Thank you.